Welcome to the Goals-Based Investing Podcast Series. I'm thrilled today to be joined by my very good friend, Scott Welsh. Scott, we're going to talk about the role and growth of model portfolios, but I think we would be remiss if we didn't start by talking about this market environment. As I look at things, it looks like we're in an environment with lower returns. Uh, yield has been challenging for quite some time. We've seen increased bouts of volatility. And of course, this thing that you and I have been talking about for quite some time as well is inflation. Seems like a tough environment for investors. How, how do you see the world and how has this helped shape the way you're positioning your portfolio? I think there's a couple, there's a couple things to unpack there, Tony. First of all, thank you for, for having me on. Um, you know, we've been in this environment for so long before, before let's call it before the past six months, where uh, all you really needed to do as an advisor to, it was to be in the market, right? So if you had equity beta in your portfolio, if you had bonds in your portfolio, um, they either were going up together or they were at least acting as hedges to each other, right? So if the market, the equity market started to go down, then the bond market tended to rally as there was a flight to quality. Uh, and so the, uh, the very traditional way of investing was working for years and years and years. Um, and then over the past six months, we've seen a complete change in the market regime. You, you've talked about some of those issues, the, the economy, Although it's still positive, there's a lot of negative sentiment out there. Uh, and then everybody is increasing, and that's because everybody's increasingly afraid of rising inflation and rising interest rates. Um, there is some concern that the Fed, for example, is so far behind the curve that it's going to find it very difficult to control inflation, which may lead to a very aggressive rate hike regime. We're already, we're already seeing some of the results of that. So through the first quarter, through you know where we are today, um, we were in this environment where stocks and bonds have gone down. And, uh, and so the, you know, there's a couple of things that have worked like commodities and some other asset classes that have helped. Um, but you know, if you're a traditional advisor who was in a traditional 60, 40 portfolio, it's probably not working very well for you right now. And um, I think what that's gonna result in uh, is a lot of advisors are going to take a hard look at their practice, especially when you have investor anxiety and say, is it really the optimal use of my time to be trying to manage these portfolios on my own or with my team or would my time be better spent uh, talking to my clients and spending time with my clients and, and helping them to get through this? You know, I don't think this is a forever phenomenon, but it's certainly going on now. Um, and I think that will drive, we're already seeing pretty rapid increase in the adoption of model portfolios. And I think this will just be a catalyst for that. I think it's a perfect setup for our discussion here today, which is, you know, we've started to see this growth of model portfolios. And I think part of it is the pivot where advisors' value proposition is changing, right? They're no longer managing portfolios, partly because they're responsible for so many other things in a family's wealth. They're, they're focused on trust and estate issues and lending and banking and all of these things. And their value proposition is really being the quarterback and harnessing all these great capabilities at their disposal. So it is interesting. We have seen the growth of the models, but I remember you and I having a discussion not so long ago where there's still some pushback from advisors. Some advisors feel somewhat threatened by it. And I know there's some really research on this that I think both in you, you and I have both kind of cited in some of the things that we've been writing. Have you sensed that's changed a little bit over the last several months as, you know, it's been a little bit of a wake up call? I, I do. And I think there's a couple of things going on. You know, we did, a, we actually did some proprietary research of, of our own and came to very similar conclusions, which is that there's some of the resistance that we heard from advisors was, oh, my client expects me to manage their portfolio. Um, you know, and, and but the end clients, the, the thousands of end clients that we talked to just said, I, I don't doesn't matter to me, you know, as long as my, my objectives are being met. And I think when you position it with an advisor as, look, we're not trying to replace you. We're trying to be an extension of what you're already doing and, you know, sort of providing an institutional level of service and, and portfolio management. I think that that resistance goes down. Uh, and, and then I think the other aspect of it is to your, to your point, there's just the expectations of what, an advisor will deliver to an end client has broadened so widely that you can't be good at everything. So you might as well focus on the things that they're, you know, they're willing to pay you more for. Reminds me a little bit of the early days of the SMA. You know, we spent a lot of time training advisors to say it doesn't lessen your value proposition that you're 
harnessing the capabilities of an institutional quality manager and you're bringing them to your clients, what you're essentially doing is you're changing your role to be the quarterback, the one who sources, puts together, and makes sure that all those pieces of the puzzles are working on your client's behalf. But, but, but again, change is often intimidating to people. And I can see where some advisors may feel like it's taking away their value. Um, talk to me a little bit about the technology and I'll go back to my Morgan Stanley days. And that was one of the things that I used to hear about all the time that as much as an advisor wanted to manage a portfolio, much like an institutional money manager, they didn't necessarily have the technology. They didn't necessarily have the trading platforms and the portfolio management platforms. And I think those things sometimes get lost in the shuffle here. It's aspirational to say that I can do the same job but it's very difficult to actually do that. Well, I, I actually think that technology is another one of the catalysts for the, the growth and the adoption of model portfolios. Uh, you think about um, a firm that may have been building internal models years ago uh, and then having to execute all those trades themselves, you know, via their custodian or whomever. Uh, today, you know, there are platforms, lots and lots of platforms out there who make these models available uh, to advisors and to third parties. Uh, and a lot of that burden is taken off of the advisor. So, you know, if you, you find a model that you like uh, from a third party provider, um, you click, you know, and you implement. Uh, and, and in many cases, those platforms can handle the, the trading and rebalancing and sometimes even the tax management. So that, that whole function has made it the ease of use of model portfolios so much better uh, that I think that's been another, for sure, been another growth factor. Technology as an enabler. Where have we heard that one before? <laughs> <laughs> and again, you know, people, you think of the robo platforms from years ago and everybody was afraid it was going to dislodge the advisor. All it is is a technology platform that actually enables the advisor to do more things. You know, so it, um, it that's, that's kind of, a, I think that's a, a big part of what's going on. Yeah, so Scott, I don't want to get into the specific portfolio, but maybe just from a macro perspective, you, you made kind of the comment about six months ago was a very different environment than it is today. What sort of macro shifts have you made as we've started to see inflation and a changing rate environment and volatility increasing? And of course, we talked about earlier where, you know, as we begin this year, we're starting to see, you know, a lot of disruption about the equity and the fixed income markets. How have you positioned the portfolio? I think, I think most portfolio managers, you know, Wisdom Tree included, um, has pro probably has a certain inherent biases in terms of how they build and manage portfolios. You know, our portfolios tend to be tilted toward value and dividends and quality. Uh, there's lots of reasons for that that you can get into if you want, but that's kind of how, if you're looking at our sort of standard model, that's, those are going to be the factor tilts that are in, you're going to see from us. Now, until six months ago, those tilts weren't necessarily working for us, right? It was because it was a large cap growth driven stock market anyway. Uh, but today, those are the exact factors that are, it, it, remember we talked at the very beginning that interest that bonds have not been a very effective hedge this year to, to your equity portfolio. The things that have been more effective have been uh, stocks that tilt towards value and quality and dividends. And, and even though they're going down, they're not immune to what's happening, but they're, they're holding their, their value much better because, uh, especially with dividends, uh, you know, the whole point of getting more of your return earlier in the form of a dividend is, is growing and appeal to a lot of investors. You know, the other thing that, and Tony, you and I have talked about this, and, and you know, you're the subject matter expert on it. Um, it. The last 10 years have been pretty rough for alternative investment. Let's call it the non-traditional sorts of things like real assets and and long, short, managed futures, and you know, things like that, uh, because you didn't need them, right? And today, again, those those have been very effective uh, hedges. The commodity space is is up very positive this year. Managed futures is up mildly, you know, to flat. Well, flat in a down 14 market sounds pretty good to me. And so I think when you what we're seeing certainly on the inbound side is a lot more interest in, hey, what, what do you have that's not stocks and bonds that I might either app access through one of your models or that I might uh, you know, find some products and put them into my models. And I think that's a smart idea. I think the, you know, I, I wrote a blog not too long ago called, you know, does diversification matter again? 
and kind of dove into this a little bit. Uh, and I think that's where we're at. I think we're, we're re-entering a regime where diversification is going to matter again, and, and advisors should be thinking about that. And I love you brought up alternatives because absolutely, I think this is an environment that, that, that is very conducive for alternatives. The other sort of uh, twist on that is inflation, something you know we've, we've certainly talked a lot about, and it's, it's been a topic at the editorial advisory board as we've thought about preparing advisors for this shift. And guys like you and I, we remember how bad it was in the 80s. I, I still think a lot of advisors, they've only read about inflation in the history books other than the last six months or so. What, what specifically are you doing in the portfolio for inflation? Are you using tips or using real assets? Yeah, we, we, we don't use tips a lot. Uh, just because I think that's kind of the default uh, solution for a lot of folks because it has inflation protection in the name of it. Yeah. Um, but if you actually look at, at the performance of tips over time, they, they haven't really been all that effective if inflation actually turned out to be different than what was priced into the, into the tips at the time that you bought it. Um, and, and also the average duration of tips is longer than the ag, right? So if you, are, if you believe that we're in a rising rate environment, uh, and you have a longer duration asset in there, that, that may or may not work out so well for you. I think, it, again, if you go back and look at some of the historical data, uh, the, they, they would suggest that uh, in moderate to mild inflationary environments, and I would say that maybe we're, maybe we're gonna get back there at some point, um, stocks are fine. You know, Stocks do a good job of hedging inflation because they represent real assets. Right. Uh, you know, and then if you get to higher levels of inflation, like we're seeing today, um, you know, commodities, other kinds of real assets, you know, precious metals. Um, although, be, you know, be careful, gold is not the go-to inflation hedge that everybody thinks it is, but it has, does have some properties that can help. And uh, and so I think that if you're looking to hedge inflation, I would be looking to shorten the duration of my bond portfolio, uh, for sure. And uh, because the shorting of the curve is going to be rising, you know, if the, if the assumptions about the Fed are correct, the shorting is going to rise. So you probably want to gain a little more access to that part of the curve. Um, and then take a look at, uh, you know, the kinds of stocks that historically, or the sectors that have historically been reasonable hedge inflator, in, uh, inflation hedges, and then commodities, real assets, precious metals, that kind of thing. That's great. And a lot of good information in there, and, uh, and I'm glad... You know, on the tips, I've, I've kind of thought the same thing. You know, we brought tips out into the market before we really had inflation. And it seemed like, you know, they're not necessarily a good surrogate. Um, so thank you. Thank you for that. So, so let's, I think I would be remiss if I didn't ask you as, you know, as an investment guy, as a guy who runs model portfolios, what you think about crypto. And I don't necessarily want you to make a call on it, but I'd be curious as you're thinking about your expanded playbook and you've already talked about how you're adding different sort of ingredients in there to build your portfolios out. What role should or could crypto assets play in portfolios and how should advisors think about them? Because I, I think everywhere I go and Scott, I'm sure it's the same thing with you. People are constantly asking about crypto, really trying to understand it. Uh, without getting into product, where do they fit? How should advisors think about them? Well, let's, let's talk about a couple of different aspects of that. The, the challenge right now uh, with getting crypto into a portfolio, if that's what you wanted to do, uh, is that uh, you may not, they, they may be held away assets, right? So you may not be able to custody those assets where the rest of your model is, is custody. That, that'll probably change over time. Yeah. Uh, so if you want to include crypto, you know, you, you might, right now you might have to use a different custodian or a different access platform. Uh, so that's that's part one. Um, there there are some products out there that have Bitcoin futures in them, and uh, and so you can get you know mo modest access that way uh, if that's what you're trying to do. You know we we the regulators are still examining the idea of a, just a pure crypto product, but uh, you know at some point that that question will be answered yes or no. Uh, I, in in terms of of allocation. Uh, you know, there's 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 no good, there's, there's nothing good that has come out of the Russia-Ukraine war, nothing. But I think that what it did make people realize is that they may not want to keep their money in a bank, right? They may want to keep their money in a portable store of value, and, and crypto certainly represents that. And so I think what my point of that is not making a, a 
a bet on the future of it, other than I think that that kind of catalyzed the mainstreaming of crypto away from a, what I would have viewed as a purely speculative device to something that's going to increasingly become a little more commonplace. Uh, from a from a portfolio construction perspective, I still wouldn't be allocating very much there, even if I could. Uh, so I do think it's still pretty volatile. You know, it, it's going to be a source of volatility in the portfolio. Uh, the track record there was a there was some discussion a little while ago that maybe it was an inflation hedge, but I don't think those correlations have held up recently, and the, and the data series is too short anyway to make that conclusion. Um, so I, but I would view it as a, a replace for, as a, you know, a replacement for part of your commodity exposure. Yeah. So if you're going to find a place for it and you have to fund it from somewhere, I'd probably start with commodities. Scott, this is probably an issue we'll need to come back and revisit when we actually have more ETFs in the marketplace. I just didn't want to kind of leave it out there. And, and you're right that there are some products that obviously future space products have contain with backwardation problems. And I know there's a lot of pressure of actually having physicals. Uh, so we'll see where that takes us. Scott, thank you so much for your time today. Sure. Your wisdom's appreciated. Uh, as I said, we'll have to have you back because there's so much more that we could cover. Thank you, my good friend, Scott Welsh. It's my pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.